This week on the Computer Chronicles, how to create your own website. We'll show you the basics of good web design, the do's and don'ts of the craft. We'll show you how to add sophisticated features to your web page using tools like the new Macromedia Backstage Internet Studio. We'll look at the secrets of graphic design and graphic optimization with a tool called Web Image, and we'll explore the new arena of virtual reality and 3D websites. Plus a visit to some inner city teenagers who are now professional web designers, and we'll go to a trade show competition where teams of web designers had to create a complete website in just eight hours. Plus, we'll have this week's computer news, my pick of the week. It's all coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by SoftSource Incorporated, publishers of Pro One Software, educational software for young adults. Additional funding from PC Connection and Mac Connection, the catalog and online superstore with over 10,000 PC and Mac products, award-winning service, toll-free technical support, and overnight delivery, www.pcconnection.com. And by LearnTo.com, the ability utility, the website that shows you how to do just about anything. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. Well, everybody has a website these days, don't they? You don't? Well, we're going to show you how to create your own home page. And one of the first issues you have to deal with is the graphic design of your page. And Jay, that's your territory. You're senior art director at Atomic Vision. Right. You do this every single day. The first question I have is, what's the object here? I mean, what am I trying to accomplish in the design of my home page? I think the, the biggest thing is to really communicate clearly your message, whether it be selling proprietary software to Unix support crews, or okay. is it uh, selling your brownie recipe that you're So the content yeah. and the audience really should drive how you would design it. Absolutely. All right, now the choices are obviously lots of text or lots of graphics. And, and give us some examples of, of sites on both sides of that equation. Well, when the Internet kind of really took off a year ago, uh, most of the sites were just text and very little images, mm -hmm. uh, very similar to Yahoo's layout. Um, for Yahoo, it's been very successful. And they've stuck with it, right? Sure, because they're a launching pad to other sites. And really. what you're looking for is words and speed. Right. So they got it. Companies have realized that in order to keep people's attention on their site, they have to really pump up the graphics, pump up the content of the page, and make it easy for people to really go from product to product. So you're saying if it's of a more sort of entertainy kind of thing, a more competitive kind of website, a more television-y kind of right. thing, you gotta, you gotta juice it up. Very similar to, uh, to CNET, mm -hmm. because it is content. Very and different. They wanna keep people at their site, they wanna keep people going from product to product within CNET's family of uh -huh. products. So in other words, there's a common look to the different CNET sites. They used a common background, common colors, yeah. uh, text, how they laid the text And out. again, this is kind of a TV mentality. I mean, you, right. you want to keep them from the clicker, <laughs> and so keep on showing interesting stuff that will keep you going. Absolutely. I mean, the attention span of surfers these days are very, very yeah. short. All right, now that's kind of the easy part, text versus graphics. Mm -hmm. Now we're dealing with Java and applets and plugins right. and video right. and audio. Right. Where do you come down on that? There's something called the technology payoff. And that's really balancing how much technology you put on your page as opposed to what message you're going to try to get across. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, you go to the Popular Mechanics site, and you think Popular Mechanics is a magazine. It's going to give you articles. It's going to yeah. give you It nice looks pretty simple. It's right. a bunch of text. But the first thing they tell you is that it's going to take a long time to download. It says, please note, this is a computationally demanding site. Right. In other words, go get a cup of coffee, come back later. Right. <laughs> and Maybe it'll be here. And the payoff is a 3D rendering of their logo. What's the payoff? Not too much. Yeah, who's going to wait for that? <laughs> you want to find out how to fix your, your deck or something, Exactly. Right? Uh, as opposed to the Honda site, mm -hmm. where you come there, and it's using a very minimal amount of technology, JavaScript, and you get a big payoff. You get to see what color car you want. And, and that is, I mean, that's so fast, it's instant. That you really get some, as you say, payoff. Something good happens right. when you just click on something. So this technology is more interactive, whereas the other technology is really obstructing the yeah. message. 
But I mean, this is relatively complicated stuff, though. I mean, you know, a beginner is not going to go put a Java applet no. inside their no. home page. Absolutely not. Now, now, what about the graphics in general? I mean, the problem, as you point out, with the graphics is it takes time. Right. I mean, there are tools, aren't they, that, that sort of help you solve some of these problems? There's the WYSIWYG editors, is what you see is what you get. Yeah. And it's pretty much like the standard um, kind of like page layout right. desktop publishing. And you just put your graphic and your text on the page. And you see it right there. And so you see it right easy. there. There's also text editors or code editors like BB Edit, where you type in your text. It's like DOS versus Windows. A little more powerful, a little more complicated. Right. Jay, more thanks complicated. a lot. Thank you. All right. Well, designing a website may seem like a complicated task, but it's not really. In fact, one group of teenagers has moved quickly from designing their own website to forming a new business that creates websites for paying customers. East Palo Alto is minutes away from Stanford University and the high-tech, high-cost world of Silicon Valley. And yet the people in this suburb are more familiar with poverty and unemployment than with computers. Plugged In is a nonprofit organization determined to change that by giving residents free access to computers and the web. Plugged In Enterprises is the business side of the organization with branches in desktop publishing, multimedia, and website design. The projects that we work on and the teams that we work on come from different backgrounds. They come from, we have teens as well as young adults. We have ages 14 to ages 19. And the hardest part of my job would be just to keep them focused because of the different personalities. Like we have some people who are just introverted and they don't really like meeting with clients. So it's my job to bring that out in them, you know, to, to develop a skill where they could meet with clients and feel open and talk with clients as well. And then also, we have teens that are really wired. So what I have to do is just bring them down and develop some structure in them. In spite of their youth, the plugged-in web designers have worked on projects big and small for clients around the country. From travel guides to commercial sites to home pages, plugged-in's teenage experts have a keen sense of design, even if they cannot always explain it. I have no clue what it is, just do it and if it looks good, ask some other people, ask the kids around here, they, the kids know what they're talking about. Plugged In's programs have no age limits or skill requirements and there are no limits to their members' success. Working with my group in particular, the web group, even though they come from different backgrounds, they have different personalities, the one thing that they have in common is consistency and they have, a, they have the willing to learn. You know, they, they want to learn new things. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Laurie Anderson. Once you've got the basics built into your new web page, you might want to get a little more sophisticated, like customized pages, information capture, discussion groups, or even Java applets. And Steve, we've already talked about with Jay what a website ought to look like. Now I want to actually go through the design process. You're going to be using Macromedia's new uh, Backstage Internet uh, Studio, it's called, right? Correct. That's right. All right, so how do, I, how do I start here? What do I do? Well, it, it works a lot like a word processor. So you can see I'm just typing in some text here. This uh, web page I'm building for you is a home page for a for an online mm -hmm. uh, service called Aardvark that uh, allows you to buy uh, pet supplies online. Okay. So, um, you know, again, it's a lot like a word processor. Yeah, I mean, you type and you center and you pick the font and all the rest of that That's stuff, right. right? Right now, I'm inserting a table, and tables are a popular way to lay out elements on a web page. So I just drag and drop an image into the So not the a table data itself. table, but really a layout table in which you can then drop objects in the cells of that table. That's right. You can use tables for either of those purposes. Okay. Um, so next, in the, in the uh, other cell of the table, I'm inserting a, a Shockwave movie. And Shockwave is, is Macromedia standard for uh, putting right. multimedia. So we're going to pass on the, on the really hard part, which is where the graphic came from and where the video came yeah, from. Yeah, that's right. But that's this right. is the layout part, mm -hmm, anyhow. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me just show you the source mode. This is the c code that we've created so far. If you use an editor, a text editor, um, this is the way you do it. Okay, so if I knew HTML, mode. I could go in here and actually type that code myself. That's right. Or That's you can right. do it in your WYSIWYG mode mm -hmm. on the screen. Mm -hmm. So one final element I want to put on here is called a backstage object. And, and this is what really sets backstage apart, which is um, I'm going to display a list of products that mm -hmm. comes from a database or it could come from a spreadsheet. So I connect to a database right now. This is the products table, and I want to show the product make, 
the product model, the product description, and the product's price, just like that. Let me save this stuff. And this page is ready now for us to go look at. And would this be live and linked to the actual database? Yeah, if the data changed in the it database, would automatically it would automatically here. update. That's, that's right. So let's save our page and jump over into the browser. Okay, so we see what this thing looks like for yep, real? Yep, I have it under my bookmark to be speedy. And uh, here it's coming in now, the Shockwave movie's coming in. Uh -huh. And there's a little aquarium scene there. Uh, and and down below here, there. I have the product table. Um, I think I can shoot the fish down here well, if I want to. <laughs> one other thing I want you to show us, Steve, what, you know, a lot of times you want a hot spot on a particular graphic so that you can click and do something there. How do you turn, say, that aardvark graphic you put in there in, into having a hot spot, a hot link to something sure, else? Sure, I'm on it right now. Um, I just double clicked on my image to bring up the, uh, to bring up the, the uh, properties of the image. And I just use my drawing tool here to draw a, um, draw a hot spot. So you just define what you want the hot spot area to be. Right, and then you browse over to the page. And you know, what website. you want to happen when you click on exactly. the hot spot. So um, that's all set up now. Let's go ahead and save that. Jump back over into the browser. And we can reload the page. So and you gotta reload to get that new functionality. That's in exactly there. right. And then we will click on the hot okay, spot. Okay, now as you can it. see when you move your cursor over the hot spot, you got a little hand and something's mm -hmm. gonna happen. And what did you tell it? You could just go back to your home page or something when you click there. That's right. There, and there you go. All right, very cool. So it's Thanks. backstage Internet Studio. Thanks right. a lot, Steve. Well, the key to a good web page is good graphics. We've heard that several times. But the key to a good web page is also a fast page that won't take forever to download. How do you strike that balance? Chris, I guess that's a question I have for you. Uh, you've got some techniques that you can use to do that. What are they? Well, I'm going to show you our web image product. And web image was built around the fact that you should optimize your graphics for your web page so you can reduce the download time. And uh, when someone comes to your site, they're not uh, bogged down waiting so for So optimize is still have a good looking graphic, but shrink the file as small as possible so you can shrink the download time. That's correct. There's a couple different techniques a web publisher can do. I've loaded a very large graphic into our web image product at this point. The first thing they can do to uh, reduce the size of an image file is to actually change the dimensions of it. And the key to do, doing this is to do it without compromising quality. So, so I'll reduce just a smaller picture, number one. That's correct. Right? So I'll reduce this file over by over half, and you see we haven't compromised our quality at this okay, point. Okay, so it's good quality, a little picture that's now half the file size. That's correct. What else? Now the other thing is. It's that still a pretty do, big file though, right? I mean, what is that it? is correct. Uh, at this point, it's still around the realm of 400K. Okay. Okay, the other way that you can uh, reduce the file size is to actually remove colors from the image. Now, WebImage provides an intelligent color reduction system that actually removes colors that are not going to be perceived by the eye. So if I don't see blue or red or something, they say don't waste your time sending those colors over. That is correct. So what I'm going to do here is take this from 16.7 million colors all the way down to 256 colors. Mm -hmm. and we still have a very high quality image on the hmm. back end. Uh, and how much have you reduced the file size this time? If I went and saved this off as a GIF file now, it would be about 17K in size. So that's a huge savings. That is correct. All right, so our, there are tricks you can play. To, you still have your graphics, but make them move a lot faster. That's correct. Now, uh, suppose I want to turn that into a button. Well, there is a... WebImage has a number of different effects that are web page related. One of them is creating a button. Mm -hmm. We found a lot of users wanted to uh, take an image and actually make it look like a button that you could press. So easily we run in through it our optimize our, our buttonize filter yeah. here, That's and easy. now we have an image that looks like a, a button that they could. What, what about the file format for images, Chris? You can use a GIF file. You can use a JPEG file. What's the difference? Sure, uh, JPEG files are 24-bit files. Um, and they are very good for images that have a lot of color content Like to the them. flowers we're looking at? Oh, that's correct. This basket of vegetables here mm -hmm. has a lot of colors in it, and it's very good for the JPEG format. You'll get uh, compression ratios up to 14 to 1, wow. but they do it by actually removing data from the file. Now, the GIF format up here is very good for uh, images that have low color counts okay. in them. Uh, for example, these logos are great to save off in the GIF format. So pretty much, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a trade-off between the two. But you can combine both on the same page as we have here, depending on what you want to use. That is correct. Now, now I know you can do transparencies also, which you want to do sometimes to make it look a little more sophisticated. Show us that. Sure. What you can do in WebImage is here we see our logo first off. And this, we wanted to create this white background to be transparent. So with web image, we did that, selected that area to be transparent, and now the background of the web page shows yeah. through. All right, finally, you know, a lot of people want animations on their web pages right now, but they don't want to have to figure out Java and all that stuff. You have a way of doing that. That is correct. It's called uh, GIF animations. Uh, basically, their structure is quite simple. 
allows you to set up a sequence of images and then save it off as one image file. Uh, here I've got this spinning globe animation, and I can uh, edit the timing and the transition between all of these. And then when I put it on a web page, I call it up just as I would any image, mm -hmm. and then the browser will actually sequence through the images. So again, this is not an applet. This is literally an animation, a that series of 12 cells that are just repeating themselves. So you can get the same effect. That is correct. Very yep. cool. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. All right, well, guess what? There's a new trade show just for web designers. It's called the Web Design and Development Exhibition. It was held recently at the Moscone Center here in San Francisco. It was the all-star game of web designers. Two teams of hand-picked members, four from the East Coast and four from the West Coast, struggling to make a finished product in eight hours at the Web Design and Development Conference in San Francisco. It was called Cool Site in a Day, and the real winners were the charities who got free websites at the end. A great website is a website that works well for its intended audience and does it with elegance and style. So that's our real challenge today, targeting our website for our audience and pulling it off with elegance and style. The teams were only told their assignments a few minutes before starting, which made it hard to plan ahead. We met yesterday for about four hours and just figured out you know, what, what the possible content might be, what our strategy would be where we hope to be at which point during the day, which all sort of went out the window after about the first three hours. But, you know, it helped. It helped give us some structure. The East Coast team created a site for a publication about the homeless called Spare Change, while the West Coast team adopted Artists for a Hate-Free America. Both groups got a very good deal. If anyone could get a site together in eight hours, it's these teams, because they really are the best. And uh, I, I know, um, well, first of all, you could never hire them You're on your own because they all work for different companies. So we, we estimated the value at about $20,000 for each site. As the clock ticked on, the teams increased their pace, and the excitement was contagious. Both teams were confident, sort of. Well, I think we'll, uh, I think we'll see what it's about. I, I think it's, uh, we're, we're on, uh, on, uh, not on home turf here, so I'll be as diplomatic as I can. But uh, I'm confident that we're going to build a really good site. I want to thank you all for participating in the Cool Site in a Day contest. We're officially stopping now, and the judging is going to start. And one of the two teams will win this lovely cup at 9 o'clock tonight at the Microsoft Party. After the judges scrutinized each site, the winner was announced, the East Coast team. It was a matter of simplicity and clarity. The West was heavily technically oriented. They won, you know, whiz-bang stuff on the screen. Whereas the East Coast, because they took more of a look at the content that they were given and how they could present the content on the screen uh, in an editorial fashion rather than the technical gizmos that one could get out of it. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Tom Van Horn. What is the future of web design? Probably 3D and the creation of virtual worlds online. There is a design language just for that purpose called VRML, VRML, the Virtual Reality Modeling Language. And Robert, that's what you guys are using with right. your tool, VRealm Builder, to create these 3D worlds. Show us a couple of, of examples. Obviously, the shopping mall is one environment that, that people think about when you get sure. to the virtual world. What is this one we're looking at here? Well, right now, we've got like a web page that is set up in both HTML and VRML. Mm -hmm. uh, they can interact with each other. Over here, I've got traditional HTML right. to sort of give me some information about the mall that I've entered. But I can also walk through the mall and interact with it. I can right, so this here. is sort of Doom-like. I can navigate through this environment online. Right. And where am I going? Going into the mall here, and if I want to see... So that's know, a shop of some sort? Right, we've got a, a CD store. store. So we can see what the rock pick of the week is, and we can continue looking around the store. And, okay. In uh, fact, we see a Sheryl Crow poster on the wall. Yeah, I can double click on that and, and listen to what the music hear is. Hear what the pick of the week is. All right, now one of the nice things would be nice if you really want to create a virtual world is I walk in here and there are other people in there. Right. Maybe I bump into another customer and, and she says, Hey, have you heard the latest Sheryl Crow album? Can you actually build those kinds of avatars with, with real characteristics? Sure, uh, that's a very popular application of VRML right now, and that is multi-user worlds. Um, with our VRealm Builder, we can build anything from a simple object to an entire environment, and that would include an object like an avatar. Uh -huh. 
So I'll go ahead and open one up here. So you can design not only that, that visual figure, but actually build characteristics and behaviors okay. into that right. character. Right, for instance, So if I get figure so close to him, he talks back to me or whatever. Right. All right, now speaking of which, I want you to bring up your temple example, because okay. that's really a good one. Besides the shopping mall, we think of perhaps virtual travel as a great application for virtual worlds in 3D. Uh, and this is a good example because stuff happens here, which really does create a kind of cyberspace environment. Right. Uh, as soon as you get up that, uh, get that up there, show us what happens when I sort of go to that temple and walk inside. And tell okay. us what you're doing. Well, uh, right here I've got it open in B-Realm Builder. Uh, we've got uh, tools to create the stuff. We've got the visual side of it over here and a representation of the file over here. Mm -hmm. I can start strolling through the environment like this. Um, Actually, I'll just go ahead and jump right ahead to a little bit closer to the outside of the okay, temple. So I'm sort of on this virtual tour wanting to walk inside this ancient temple. Here. Right. I'm going to put it into test mode so things actually start happening. As I get closer, a bird flies out of the temple. And that won't happen until I get closer. All right, so what you've done here, if you... you back, but we're going right. to get closer, and he there goes. All right, so what you've done here is not only design a bird, not only design an animation, but basically program that bird to say, if a person gets right. too close to you, if an avatar gets too close to you, fly away, which is what a real animal would do in that situation. Right, exactly. How do you, how do, you do that? Show us how you, you program in those sort of triggers. Okay, let me bring up a version, early version of the dove uh, at the point where I just sort of set him up to be animated. Mm -hmm. Go into our keyframe animator see where I've over a period of time set up the flight sequence and everything else like that but what you're talking about is actually triggering right and by doing bringing up our trigger okay so you can say here, hey if I touch it something will happen right. if I look at it something will happen if I get too close to it something will right happen. so I can easily just put a proximity sensor on it which says within so and so right. feet he flies away. And well. obviously, if you start using your imagination, that creates all kinds of real-world interactions in a virtual environment. Absolutely. That could be fantastic on right. the web. Real briefly, what, what are the demands and bandwidth in being able to do this stuff? You know, the great thing about Vermal is that it was always intended to be for the web. It uh -huh. was not something that was ported to the web. Um, this file, the temple, for instance, is just over 100 kilobytes uncompressed. So deal. it's not big a deal Great. considering you could walk anywhere okay. in it. Robert, thanks very much. Thank you. Now for this week's Random Access and a special report on personal computing tips from Mike Elgin. One of the most powerful but underutilized features in Windows 95 is the Send To item. You've probably seen it when you've right-clicked on a document and noticed this Send To item on the context menu. By selecting the items on the menu, it either opens a document, for example, in the uh, application that's there, or it moves it to that location. I'm going to show you how to take advantage of this powerful feature. By double-clicking on my computer and going into the C drive, then the Windows folder, you notice that there is a Send To folder. Now what this is, is these, are, these shortcuts are the items on the, on the menu. And you can add uh, anything you like to those, uh, documents, uh, locations. I'm going to add the, uh, the desktop as a location. To, to my menu by simply putting a shortcut to the desktop inside. Double click on Windows, find the desktop item, and I'm right clicking and dragging, letting go, and selecting Create Shortcut here. Now that I've got this item there, whenever I go to my documents and use the Send To menu, you find that shortcut to the desktop is here, and I can actually move the, uh, the file there. You can also uh, put cascading folders into this Send To menu by just creating ordinary folders right-clicking the, on the area, selecting New, and then Folder. And anything I put in there now becomes part of this cascading menu. Now you notice when I go there and select uh, right-click on the folder, Send To, I have a cascading menu. You can put as many of those as you like. That's it for today's tips. Back to you, Stuart. Now for my pick of the week. We've shown you several very sophisticated tools for creating, designing, and enhancing your website. But some of these tools are a bit complicated to use. However, I have found the absolute simplest piece of software that lets you design a very nice looking website in a matter of minutes and you don't have to know anything. You just fill in some blanks and next thing you know, you have a cool looking website complete with hot links, graphics, etc. The program is called the Website Creation Kit from a Canadian company called Homepage. Designing your website with this software could not be easier. You simply click through a series of menu tabs, fill in the blanks, 
and you have a pretty good looking website. It's easy to go back in and make changes later. The software comes on a CD-ROM and works for Macs or Windows PCs. It comes with several packages, in fact, which let you easily customize a personal website or a small business site. It also comes with a nice animated tutorial and no manual. Check out their website at hmpg.com. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll be back here again next week with more of the best in hardware, software, and the net. If you need more information on anything you saw on today's program, check out our website at pctv.com. I'm Stuart Chaffe. Hope to see you here next time. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by SoftSource Incorporated, publishers of Pro One Software, educational software for young adults. Additional funding from PC Connection and Mac Connection, the catalog and online superstore with over 10,000 PC and Mac products. Award-winning service, toll-free technical support, and overnight delivery. www.pcconnection.com And by Learn2.com, the ability utility. The website that shows you how to do just about anything.